Greetings and salutations friends and welcome to yet another uh, Warhammer 40k lore video. I had originally planned Warhammer today, but the chaos video went way longer than I thought it would. I didn't want to relegate the Relictus to the tail end of that one, so as promised today, we are going to be talking about the Relictus Space Marine chapter as a perfect example of chaos being used against chaos and the unfortunate consequences of such actions. Though, to be fair, hashtag not all, not all renegade space main chapters that decide to use Chaos artifacts for their own good get completely and utterly screwed and end up in the Eye of Terror. Not all. For example, we have the Bloody Magpies, also uncommonly known as the Blood Ravens, who like to steal every single fucking artifact they can get their grubby little thieving hands on. And then of course there's the Soul Drinkers, who got rather chaosy to the point where their <laughs> eventual chapter master had literal spider legs, and considerable portions of the Legion was mutated well and truly beyond the tolerance of the Imperium. And yet in death, they were eventually how how should I say it? Reformed? No, that's not the right word. Justified? No, that's not really it either. I think, if anything, redeemed might be the correct term, because at the end of the day they were undoubtedly corrupted by chaos. Hell, they'd even run a couple of errands for a certain change of ways, which is not exactly something a loyal Space Marine chapter would ever do. And of course there's that whole thing about, you know, extra limbs and spiders and shit, which again is rather pushing the tolerance level of the oh-so-tolerant Imperium. And they were hunted, attacked by several chapters, and eventually brought to quote-unquote justice before a conclave of their brothers who would pass judgement over them. Before that all could finish, however, there was a small problem with a demon invasion, which the Soul Drinkers fought back against valiantly, and in the process of doing so, basically the entire chapter got wiped out. And after this supreme act of self-sacrifice, they were posthumously cleared of all charges of wrongdoing, and although the Soul Drinker's chapter could not technically speaking be redeemed, all of the Soul Drinkers that died were chiseled on a sacrificial pillar aboard the Imperial Fist's phalanx. An act made even more generous due to the fact that the Soul Drinkers might not actually have been Sons of Dorne, after all. There is even some evidence to suggest that they might have a somewhat more heretical forefather. But that is kind of related to the point. There are Astartes chapters that have gone down the path of full-on hardcore renegade before and have returned to the quote-unquote light. And so simply just being a renegade chapter doesn't necessarily mean they're full-on chaos. As for the Relictors, however, well, that's what we're going to be diving into now, isn't it? So, the Relictors chapter was originally called the Fire Claws, or were they? You see, the Relictors have had many, many, many different hands working on their lore over the last 30 plus years, and so they can be a little bit confused. It is unclear whether or not they were the Fire Claws and then became the Relictors, or if they always were the Relictors and the Fire Claws simply came about because another author went like, okay, well, they became the Relictors, right? So who were they originally? No information on that? Well, I'm gonna invent a chapter. There is also suggestions that they did not call themselves the Relictors, but that their enemies began calling them the Relictors because they liked collecting shiny things, which is, you know, not an entirely insane idea. And of course, the biggest moment of derp possibly in the entirety of 40k history happened when they were handed to an author that didn't really know 40k. And so he stated that the Relictors were a mix of Ultramarines and Dark Angels gene seed, which would certainly make them damn fucking unique since that is basically impossible. Since, of course, we know that Gene Seed works by mutating the host body to be closer in form and genetic structure to the Liege Lord of the Legion. In the name of the Ultramarines, that would, of course, be the spiritual Liege himself, Robot Girly Man, and in the case of the Dark Angels, that would be Hides in the Corner and Cries All Day, L. Johnson. 
neither of whom are very much to look up to in this humble Blood Angel's opinion, but hey, details. As such, there will be some abridgings here, but I figured I'd make you aware of these little incongruences before I got started, and I'll be presenting my own versions of these and what makes the most sense from the available information. So, the Relictors chapter. They were founded during the Praces founding. This was a founding specifically designed to reinforce the Eye of Terror, as they had been noticing that the damn thing had gotten more and more active of late, and the Imperium was getting damned sick of Abaddon wandering his way out and being useless all the time. So they figured they might as well fortify the damn thing with another 20 Astartes chapters. And by the standards of post-heresy imperial foundings, it was relatively successful. Out of a total of 20 odd chapters, only 8 <laughs> turned to chaos. <laughs> only. Though to be fair here, they are all stationed around the Eye of Terror, not exactly a region of space known for its soothing ambiance. And again, to be fair, at least one or two of those eights might just simply have been wiped out due to fighting chaos. So, you know, odds are that if you look at it a little bit generously, only about a fourth of them probably turned full on traitor. <laughs> those are pretty good odds, everything considered. I mean, again, by that metric, the Relictors had a 75% chance of not going crazy. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, that was not to be their destiny, or at the very least, kinda, maybe not really. So, the Relictors chapter, originally then known as the Fire Clause, had a fairly good service record. They seemed to behave themselves decently and they fought against Chaos like they were supposed to, until they ran into a particularly nasty Chaos Warband, led by a champion of Zinch known as the Excoriator. This particular warlord had acquired himself a Space Hulk, which meant he was a pretty considerable threat to the Imperium, and as such he had to be dealt with nice and quick. The Relictors mobilized practically their entire chapter, along of course with their fleet, to go and intercept the Space Hulk. Along the way, they were joined by Inquisitor de Marche. Or to be entirely precise, it is unclear whether or not it was de Marche who requisitioned the Relictors to go deal with the Space Hulk, or if Demarche and his retinue simply attached themselves to the Relictors after they'd already begun moving. Oh, and by the way, at this point they would probably still be called the Fire Claws, but I'm going to keep calling them the Relictors because it's less confusing that way. Anywho, the Relictors found the Space Hulk and proceeded to cripple its main drive engines. This meant the Space Hulk was kinda boned, as now the Relictors of course could teleport in strike squads and attack with boarding pods wherever they wanted. The Chaos Renegades had to defend the entirety of the Space Hulk, which can be damn bloody large, whilst the Relictors could simply strike and retreat at will. And after a short but futile resistance, the Chaos Renegades quickly realized this and gathered all of their strengths around the main engine compartment. The Relictors had managed to cripple the engines themselves, but the main engine compartment housing the actual mechanics of the engines were one of the most heavily armored areas of the Space Hulk, and as such, simply just bombing them out really wasn't an option. Destroying a Space Hulk is essentially impossible in a standard fleet action. You're going to need several capital class ships to even have a hope, and even then it's probably going to take weeks. Generally speaking, space hulks that are being disassembled are literally just that, disassembled. They are put in a stationary orbit around a nearby astral body, and then over the course of decades, they are slowly but surely picked apart or destroyed depending on the type of ship. Since of course Space Hulks are made up of dozens of different ships that have collided into each other in the warp and have essentially become fused together. An Imperial ship might for example be salvaged, or at the very least an attempt will be made, if that is not possible, it will be picked apart and recycled. If it is a Xenos ship, maybe the Adeptus Mechanicus will have a go at it, or maybe it'll just be outright destroyed because of Xenos. If it's a Chaos ship, well, bring out the blasting charges boys and ready the flamers because we've got some cleansing to do, and so on and so on. This means that a Space Hulk of the size used here 
The Relictus basically would have no way of actually destroying it, as such they couldn't simply just blow up the drive section and call it a day. In all due likelihood, they were quite literally forced to go in and deal with the remainder of the warband in good old fashioned nitty gritty close quarters combat, and that is precisely what they did. Luckily for the Relictus, and rather unusually for a founding chapter so late in the Imperium's history, they had access to a full company of Terminator Elites. And a Space Hulk is the perfect place to deploy tactical dreadnought armor. Long, winding, narrow tunnels, short fields of fire, and tons upon tons of choke points. And since a single Terminator can essentially stand his merry little ass in the middle of a hallway and essentially lock down that entire hallway for, well, practically indefinitely, basically, that means that a hundred brothers in tactical dreadnought armor can control a truly vast area of space. Essentially, if you want to make a vector of approach practically unworkable for the enemy, all you need to do is plunk a Terminator down a nice narrow corridor and allow him to have fun playing Whack the Weasel with whoever is stupid enough to pop their soon-to-be-squished little heads around the nearest corner. Victory was, in other words, virtually secured, but there tends to be a bit of a problem with chaos in that they've always got some kind of sneaky ass trick up their sleeve, don't they, the filthy little lying cheating sons of bitches. In this case, it was a demon sword, and not just any demon sword, it had the essence of a greater demon bound within it. This is... how do I explain this? Imagine a normal power sword, it's capable of cutting through armor pretty much like butter. A demon sword would be like a hot knife through butter, and a greater demon sword, well, if you swung that at a piece of armor with a dude inside of it, the odds are pretty good that the armor itself would go like, yeah, this is just taking the piss, and it would kill the wearer itself instead of having to be sliced open again. It was a very, very unfair advantage for the Chaos Warlord, and he managed to slay several Terminators along with wounding the Inquisitor, along with the Relictor's chief librarian by the name of Decario. However, Decario was also armed in Terminator armor, and managed to get close enough to the Chaos Warlord to close one massive oversized fist around the Warlord's sword arm, and gently yank. The rather considerable pain of having his arm not too gently yonked from his arm socket sent the Warlord into a maddened frenzy, knocking Decario off his feet and slaying another four Terminators, before Decario closing his other non-powered fist around the closest weapon he could get to hand, swung out and chopped the Chaos Champion's head off. Only then did Decario notice that the nearest weapon he had grabbed was the demon sword. And bear in mind, due to the effect of the greater demon-infused weapon, moments before this, power axes had literally just bounced off the very same bastard whose head was now rolling gently across the floor. Clearly, the demon weapon was, um, rather sharp and therefore useful. Additionally, Decario had not been turned into a rumbling, braying chaos spawn, which is kind of the line that most Imperial citizens are sold. If you so much as touch a chaos artifact, you will pretty much instantaneously be transformed into some form of a hideous mutated monstrosity that will be screaming in agony and such things. And yet, when Decario had a good look at himself, no second butthole, well, he couldn't check, but he was reasonably certain he hadn't grown a new one, no third eyeball appearing in new and innovative areas of his body, no fourth eyebrow, etc. Everything seemed remarkably normal, considering he was holding a weapon that, well, presumably screamed, whispered, or spat at him. It really depends on the type of demon weapon, really. Demonic weapons can be basically just normal swords, except they're all glowy and creepy looking, or they can be... Well, rather more interesting, you know, talking, screaming, shouting, spitting, pissing, drinking, shitting, etc, etc. There really is an endless amount of variety depending on the god involved. The puking part would be more Nurgle, whereas the pissing part would probably be more Slanesh, I guess. I'm pretty sure there's a fetish around that. Come to think of it, shitting is also- no, 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 no. <clears throat> Let us not wander up that particular rabbit hole. 
That was entirely subconscious, by the way. Never mind, moving on. The demon sword appeared to have no effect whatsoever on Dicario in the ways of, you know, horrible mutations, craziness, other such things that are generally connected to chaos. Though, of course, as we mentioned in the previous video, these things might not be quite as instantaneous as many loyal citizens have been led to believe. And Dimash, the Inquisitor, was of course quick to remind Dicario that such weapons were indeed dangerous, and that only he, a trained Inquisitor, would know how to handle them. That is, of course, also just a tiny bit of bullshit, but hey, details. Inquisitors are not, by the way, allowed to handle chaotic artifacts. This is one of the few things they are, in fact, not allowed to do. A few amongst them, of course, decide to do so anyway, and those are generally referred to as radical Inquisitors, but even within the Inquisitorial Order, where there are factions, well-known factions of radicals, they themselves do not advocate directly for using demonic artifacts. They essentially do the good old-fashioned bait of switch and going like, oh yes, I mean, I'm not personally saying we should use demonic artifacts, but wouldn't it be nice if we could, etc. And after all, they are still Inquisitors, and as such, no one can really investigate them. Well, other Inquisitors could, but... Generally speaking, it is considered to be extremely rude for an Inquisitor to pry into another Inquisitor's business and can lead to all kinds of nastiness, and so it is generally avoided. And as it happened, Demarcio is most definitively on the rather radical side. After having brought the weapon back aboard the Relicta Strike Cruiser, he argued for not disposing of the weapon or sending it back to Terra, but rather he argued that Chaos artifacts should be used against Chaos, that they were essentially the lesser of two evils. And if the weapon was as effective against Chaos as this one had clearly proved to be, Obviously, the Imperium should use the most effective weapons at their disposal, in this case a certain demonic sword, against the true servants of Chaos. And the chapter master of the then Fire Claws agreed. But of course, whilst this demonic sword was indeed very very shiny and blinking and glowing in the dark and maybe winking, talking, etc. One demon sword wasn't really enough to truly put a dent in chaos, now was it? Instead, the Relictors decided to start exploring the worlds around the Eye of Terror for more artifacts, reasoning that every artifact they acquired would be one less artifact for the true servants of chaos to use, and one more artifact for them to use against chaos. This is where some suggest that they got the name Relictors, again suggesting that their enemies called them Relictors rather than they themselves referring to themselves as such, as it didn't take particularly long before the wider Imperium started getting wind of this. However, to begin with, people were kinda, mm, uh, well, I mean, there's suggestions, but... They are a Space Marine chapter, and they were at this point at the very least partially under the wings of an Inquisitor. As such, no one could really do anything about it directly. And this is where the timeline gets a little bit wonky. So, at this time, apparently the Relictors raided an Inquisitorial Vault, which they had presumably learned about from Dimash where they killed everyone inside and stole the artifacts, or at least they thought they'd killed everyone inside. One person survived, dragged his ass back to the Inquisition, and mobilized the Grey Knights and several Imperial contingents to attack the Relictors. Apparently, the Relictors were then subjugated, they surrendered basically, and were sent on a pension crusade. Okay, but later on, they are also said to have attacked an Imperial Vault, an Inquisitorial Vault to be precise, killed everyone inside except for one survivor, who subsequently dragged his battered and bleeding ass back to the Inquisition and called in the Grey Knights. Any of this sound vaguely familiar? And whilst of course it's not entirely impossible that the exact same thing happened twice, it seems like this is yet another case of the Relictors being 
kind of confused, or more precisely, the authors writing about them being kind of confused. Rather, my take on it, based upon the various often contradictory stories, would be that the Relictors eventually garnered a bit too much of a reputation for stealing various Chaos artifacts, and they weren't really hiding it either, that's the key word. The Relictors figured that since they were doing this, kind of, on the words of an Inquisitor, they essentially had, you know, permission to do this, they figured they were acting within the remits of their authority. And so, when suddenly out of nowhere, four chapters of Adeptus Astartes, several units of Grey Knights, and an Emperor-class battleship popped into orbit above their homeworld, specifically right above their fortress monastery, and went, Bad relictors, very bad boys, hand over your thingity bobs and go on a pension crusade, they kind of went like, uh... What? And they basically agreed. They were given a chance to surrender and go on a pension crusade, and they took it. Which, this is not the actions of a chapter that has gone renegade. At the very least, they would try to resist, or at the very least flee, because, you know, if they thought they were doing something wrong, they wouldn't then go up to the people who have come there to besiege them, demanding they go on a pension crusade and go like, okay, we're not entirely sure what's going on, but, I mean, okay? Those are not the actions of a chapter that actually thought they were doing anything wrong. They seemingly were now introduced to this concept that they didn't have the backing of the Inquisition, and they were now sent out to redeem themselves, which they kind of just accepted, presumably, and this is my read of their reaction on the situation, because they didn't really know what to do. I mean, they weren't renegades, they didn't consider themselves rebels, they thought they were acting in the best interest of the Imperium, and now the Imperium and several cells of Inquisitorial agents were telling them, no, that's not the case. It must have been rather confusing for them. Oh, and by the by, it was remarkably lenient of the intervention force to even give the Relictors the choice to go on a pension crusade, and apparently this was due to the fact that the Inquisition had figured out that the Marsh had vastly overstepped his authority. This would be one of the examples where the Inquisition essentially polices itself. The Inquisition is quite literally the only organization allowed to police the Inquisition. The Marsh had gone way too far. He had actively started collecting Chaos Relics, it had become, relatively speaking, common knowledge, and he had an entire Space Marine chapter at his beck and call. I suspect that it wasn't really the fact that he was collecting Chaos Relics in and of itself that spurred the Inquisition into action, but rather the fact that he had an entire chapter doing his bidding. That is the kind of thing that would rather severely upset the delicate balance of inquisitorial power politics, and considering how vindictive inquisitors can be, that is not a very good idea. And rather predictably, Demarch did indeed lose his head over this. He was one of the requirements for letting the Relictors go on a pension crusade. They had to undertake, as mentioned, the crusade, which would last for 100 years. They would hand over all Chaos Relics, which they did, except for, you know, a few that they forgot about and, you know, happened to be stored in various secluded places aboard their fleet. You know, accidents happen. And, of course, they had to hand over Demarch. They did so reluctantly, but again, the Relictors genuinely thought they were doing this on behalf of the Inquisition, and then when several Inquisitors shows up and go like, no, 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 Demarch is actually a batshit insane psychopath, and he does not in any way represent us, they kind of had to take their word for it, but at the same time, they also clearly believed in what they were doing. Because when they are sent off on their pension crusade, they happened to cross the world of Armageddon. And if you remember from my Armageddon series, that particular planet had been visited by a certain Primarch with an anger management issue. And said Primarch had raised a very, very large monolith to channel Chaos Energy onto the planet in the middle of what was now known as the Equatorial Jungle. 
And wouldn't you know, the relictors developed a quite the fascination for said equatorial jungle. They told everybody else, including chapter master Dante, that they were hunting feral orcs. Dante and every other Imperial commander told the relictors that, okay, I mean, that's cool and shit, we're not particularly fond of the greenskins ourselves, but... There are far more technologically advanced greenskins currently rampaging across the planet. Maybe the chapter's resources and battle prowess might be better used against those orcs. To which the relictor's response was essentially something along the lines of, well, yeah, but we like it here. Obviously, this was not exactly the most robust of reasoning, but Space Marine chapters are used to and afforded a great deal of autonomy. Chapter Master Dante could, technically speaking, order them to do something, and if they didn't obey, he could, technically speaking, chastise them, and if they still disobeyed, he could, again, technically speaking, attack them, but... Well, I mean... Think about it, would you risk it? It's like, okay, I'm fighting orcs tooth and nail, billions of them all across the planet. What I really need now is to bring my entire chapter, several chapters probably, off to fight another chapter of Space Marines in the jungle. A chapter that, whilst not being particularly helpful, are at least fighting orcs somewhere? Dante didn't really have a whole lot of choice in the matter here. Again, if he chastised them for being autonomous, he might be facing the exact same music sometime later down the line himself, and secondly, he couldn't really risk open warfare within the Astartes chapter, and so he couldn't threaten them with it, because if he wasn't willing to go through with the threat, they sure as hell would not take him seriously. As for what the Relictors were actually up to, well, on the surface, they were fighting orcs. They sent out combat patrols to fight the various feral orc tribes, and they made damn sure that local Imperial commanders and troops saw them doing so. The ruse didn't last for long, however, as the relictors kept hanging around a certain part of the jungle. A certain part of the jungle where nobody else was allowed to actually go, and even the orcs, generally speaking, kept the fuck away from. Namely, the area around Angron's monolith. Undoubtedly, the relictors were looking if there wasn't something interesting left behind. The suggestions are that they were looking for pieces of Angron's Black Blade, which he wielded during the First War for Armageddon. Now, of course, the blade was famously shattered as he fought the 109 Grey Knight Terminators along with the Space Wolves. Now, this battle took place quite a distance away, and how the hell some shards of the Black Blade might have made it back to Angron's monolith is unclear. Uh, again, it's probably yet another case of the Relictors kind of being written not entirely well, unfortunately, but they did apparently find something of interest, as one of their chapter's librarians received a vision of Abaddon launching his 13th Black Crusade, and they found something they figured could maybe stop him, but they needed another couple pieces of the puzzle, and so they departed Armageddon very, very suddenly and without, I might add, any kind of approval or permission. And this action, unsurprisingly, pissed off absolutely everyone, with Chapter Master Dante going so far as to send an official complaint to the High Lords of Terra about the behaviour of the Relictors. As for the Relictors themselves, they figured they had more important stuff to do. Now, as to what they actually found on Armageddon, it is unclear. Assuming they managed to locate a shard of the Black Blade, however, that would be pretty goddamn ridiculously huge. If a demon sword with a great demon inside of it is an 8 on a scale of 1 to 10, then the Black Blade would be something along the lines of 25, as it was a weapon granted by Korn himself to a demon Primarch. A weapon like this does not destroy a target, it does not kill a person. Terms like destroy or kill are utterly pedantic terms in the face of such a weapon. Using such terms to describe this weapon would be like sending a potted plant into the sun and saying, yep, that probably got rid of the potted plant. 
you are technically correct, however, it is such a hilarious understatement that it is essentially absurd and has virtually no meaning. Oh, and again, I need to address a little bit of the, uh, there's a lot of this, isn't there, for the poor electors? I didn't remember there being that much, but here we are. So there is yet another inconsistency here. So, in the book Angron's Monolith, it is stated that they were looking for, specifically, a piece of Angron's axe, and that they found it. Now, this seems exceedingly unlikely to me, because at this point in time, Angron wasn't using his axes, the axes would be, of course, Gorefather and Gorechild. And at this point in time, Gorechild should be in the hands of Karn, who, famously, does not play well with others, and would not have gone along with Angron to Armageddon. Karn essentially doesn't take orders from anyone, and least of all Angron these days. So it's very unlikely that he, that he was Gorechild. And as for Gorefather, Angron specifically put that axe aside for the Black Blade. So I really can't see any way that either of Angron's axes or pieces of them could be on Armageddon? It seems to be a fair bit of a canon conflict, and I would personally assume that what they found were pieces of the Black Blade rather than the axes, because, well, I really don't see any way the axes would be there. But hell, even if they found those, they wouldn't be much less dangerous than the Black Blade. But anyways, having addressed that, let's move on again. So, after having played around in Armageddon for a while, they left for the Eye of Terror again to try and deal with Abaddon's latest temper tantrum, and they had a plan, but this plan necessitated them acquiring one more relic. Odd how this is, isn't it? It's always we're just, we're just one more, just, just one more, we just need another one, that's fine. After we've got this one, it's all fine, and okay, we're gonna need that one too, and maybe we'll need just, just maybe one more, yes, yes, Steely? And as it happened, the particular artifact that they were so desperately in need of at this point was in the hands of the Inquisition and a secret inquisitorial vault. Unfortunately for the people guarding said vault, their previous inquisitorial friend had given the relictors quite a lot of information and additionally, there is suggestions that the relictors still had friends within the Inquisition that were willing to feed them pieces of information. Unfortunately for the Relictors, they kind of botched this raid, and allowed at least one person to survive and bring news back to the Inquisition. And yes, this is literally the third time we're telling this story. This time, however, the Inquisition was not putting up with their shit, and sent in a force of Grey Knights against the Chapter's Orbital Fortress Monastery, which wiped them practically from existence. It is rumoured that a few hundred Battle Brothers might have survived, and that they might have fled into the Eye of Terror, but nobody knows for certain. Or do they? As it happens, the Relictors are listed as Inquisitorial Allies in a certain book. There is also mentions of a Relictor tech priest being in the service of the Inquisition, and there are also mentions of the Relictors actively fighting the forces of chaos inside the Eye of Terror. Despite their somewhat shitty treatment by the Inquisition, and to be fair, their relatively shitty treatment of the Inquisition, it would appear that the Relictors are still around in the galaxy, and it would appear that they are still screwing rather actively with the forces of chaos. And that is uh, where I will leave you, though I will mention I hope we're going to be seeing more of the Relictors in the future, because they're a really interesting chapter, and again, the argument of using Chaos against Chaos does hold a fair bit of water. It is just how they can be used, and why, that is the real question, and of course to what extent. Oh, and naturally that itsy bitsy question of will they eventually get corrupted, and well yes, probably, but hey, details. 
I would like to see, however, before anything else is written about the Relictors, that their entire story essentially gets retconned and started back up again from the beginning. I usually don't like retcons, but the Relictors have like four or five different takes on them now, and practically all of them directly contradict the others, so I think this chapter probably needs a little bit of a full and complete rewrite, basically. And so, until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.